When you're on the hunt for the perfect MCU or microprocessor for your next embedded design, what do you normally consider first? Power consumption? Most certainly. Security? Absolutely. Feature integration? Definitely. But what about hardware and software compatibility? What about scalable processing? What about the incorporation of AI or machine learning down the line? Yeah, of course, you want all of that and more. Well then, we should really talk about the Ensemble 32-bit microcontroller and fusion processors from Aleph Semiconductor. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Henrik Fladell from Aleph Semiconductor and I explore the what, where, and how of Aleph's ensemble 32-bit microcontrollers and fusion processors. We examine the autonomous, intelligent power management, high on-chip integration, and isolated security subsystem aspects of these 32-bit microcontrollers and fusion processors, the role that scalability plays in this processor family, and how you can utilize them for your next embedded design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Aleph Semiconductor. Hi, Henrik. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Amelia. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Okay, so we are talking about the future of intelligent devices today. But first, Henrik, can you set the stage for us? What kind of missing elements are you seeing in the embedded market today? Well, so one of the reasons that Aleph got founded as a company was because all of us that work for Aleph Semiconductor, we've been supplying microcontrollers, microprocessors, and this type of technology to customers for a very long time. And we have noticed throughout our careers that there are some significant gaps in kind of the market offering from legacy suppliers in terms of processing power, in terms of how broadly device family scales. It seems to be that every time a new family of devices is released, it's completely incompatible with the things that have come before it. So everything becomes very discontinuous. A lot of the devices use way more power than they really should. The amount of integration of features, functions, memories, and things like that is not as high as the customer wants it to be. Customers want to have as much as possible in the chips. They don't want a huge bill of materials because it's difficult to source it and it drives up cost. Also, in terms of things like security, to be able to actually have a complete security solution integrated in the devices, that's something that is very difficult to find. And especially if you want to pair that up with all the other kind of functionality that you need for your system, it's traditionally kind of that you get a dedicated security device, and then you need a complete separate host next to that. And also, one of the things that we noticed when we talked to a customer of ours about the future, like what do you want your application to do in four or five, six years? You know, what technology are you looking for? A lot of them is telling us that they either want to start leveraging machine learning to solve problems that they cannot properly address with the current level of technology that they have access to, or that they want to improve existing solutions by leveraging machine learning in their systems. And that's just not something that is readily available, especially in the kind of deeply embedded microcontroller type platforms. So this is one of the reasons why Aleph Semiconductors got founded to be able to bring out a new crop of devices on the market that can address all these concerns, to be able to have a concept of devices based on families that have a very broad scalability, single to multi-core MCUs, you know, that can combine things like real-time systems and high-level systems in the same chip, to be able to really focus the architecture from the beginning on getting to that lowest possible energy consumption. And then also to accelerate all of these workloads that traditionally take up a lot of processing power on the microcontroller core, which in turn drives power consumptions and other things like that, to make microcontrollers that can do machine learning, that can do graphics, that can do security, and that can do that very fast and give a lot of time back to the user that they can spend putting their device to sleep and last longer on a battery and be more green, you know? The less power you use, the more environment you save. 
we made a little video overview of Aleph Semiconductor and what it is that we're offering. And I thought I could play that to you to give you a little bit more detail about what it is that we're introducing to the market. Absolutely. Let's watch it. If you need embedded microcontrollers in the IoT space, there's one company that brings you a new family of microcontrollers and fusion processors, Aleph Semiconductor. The Ensemble family offers high-performance embedded controllers designed for the edge with built-in acceleration for machine learning. Ensemble also brings you unrivaled battery life, so you get a longer life out of a much smaller battery. And Aleph's unique AIPM technology enables you to constantly sense the environment, then selectively power on only what's needed to quickly finish complex tasks before going back to sleep. Scalable performance is also yours. The Ensemble family scales from a single Cortex M55 MCU real-time core, plus optional Ethos U55 neural processing unit, to dual MCU cores and dual NPUs then adding a Cortex A32 MPU application core, and ultimately adding another MPU core for symmetric multiprocessing. The M55 and U55 make their world debut in Aleph controllers. Security is not an add-on anymore either. With the Ensemble family, bulletproof security is built right in. In fact, a super strong isolated security subsystem orchestrates protection for the entire chip. So your device and data all stay protected throughout the product's entire life cycle. Need next level integration? It's all inside with ample memory to support image data and machine learning operations. Complete power management, low power peripherals, all monolithically integrated for maximum flexibility for smart applications like wearables, AI-assisted cameras, biometric access control, asset trackers, robots, or interactive interfaces. The Ensemble family from Aleph Semiconductor is not a tiny step. They are a giant leap forward. To find out more, go to alephsemi.com. So Henrik, what kind of benefits for embedded designers does Aleph Semiconductor bring to the table? So as I hope you saw in the video, we are really on a mission to provide a much higher level of integration in microcontrollers and microprocessors than has come from the legacy suppliers before us. And there are a couple of key value propositions that I'd like to talk a bit more about and explain in more detail how we are addressing them. One of them being scalability. I mentioned before that we're really going for this idea of releasing families of devices so that we can have a broad footprint that is suitable for a range of applications rather than to try to do a one-size-fits-all types of applications approach. So we want to have different types of performance level, different types of execution environments so that you can kind of blend real-time with application cores, single-core, multi-core, everything in the same package, sharing the same resources and scale that up and down in a way that also makes it very compatible both on the software and on the hardware side. Another thing that we've really gone for, as I mentioned, is we've tried to architect our entire offering to provide the longest possible battery life across that entire continuum of scalability. And we did the same, took the same approach with security. The way that we think about it is that in 2023, 2024, 2025, et cetera, almost every single embedded device that gets deployed is going to have to be provisioned and managed and updated in the field. So we wanted to build in the right hooks to be able to do that in a really secure way from the very beginning. We've also taken the approach to try to integrate as much functionality as we can in the devices themselves. And we do this with monolithic integration. We don't try to do packaging tricks, combining multiple dyes, et cetera because that has detrimental effect on the power consumption of the system. And I will talk about that a little bit more on some slides coming up. We've also carefully picked the way that we design our devices and the technologies we use to allow us to do this integration in a way that still promotes efficient use of space. We can include a lot of technology in our devices while still making the packages small, making it possible to do better product design and to give more real estate back to the users. And then also, as I mentioned, to include the ability to accelerate traditionally very heavyweight operations like machine learning, even in microcontrollers. 
we believe that the Ensemble family of devices are the first MCUs in the general market that can handle all of the three V type use cases being vibration, voice, and also the vision use cases in a very power efficient and fast manner in an MCU type device. Henrik, can we talk a bit more about the scalable processing you mentioned? Sure, we can do that. This slide that you're seeing now gives you an overview of the Ensemble family and how we are setting them up in terms of scalability on the application side. The Ensemble family breaks down into four series of devices, and the series are based on the number of application cores that are available to the user. As we scale, as you can see in the E1 series, it begins with a single core MCU. As we move up to E3, there is two MCU cores in the systems. And then in the E5 and the E7 series of Ensemble, we introduce what we call fusion processors. And this is where we combine MCU cores with MPU cores on the same die sharing the same resources. In the E5 device, you have the two MCU cores from the E3, and we add an MPU core to that. And in the E7, the quad core offering, it's a two plus two configuration. You have two MCU cores, you have two MPU cores, meaning you can do a lot of real-time processing. And at the same time, you can have a high-level operating system that drives things like user interfaces, advanced networking, things like that in parallel with all the real-time compute going on. So we can scale from kind of the very small applications that sleep a lot, need to wake up, do a little bit of work, and then go down again to applications that really require a lot of compute performance when they're on. Fantastic. Now, can we also take a closer look at the 32-bit MCU, MPU solutions you offer? We can absolutely do that. On this slide, you have kind of a window into what we are putting inside the devices on the application side to run the user's code. Aleph, when we got set up and when we started doing our design, we wanted to make sure that we were leveraging the most modern, the most current, the most up-to-date processor technology that was available. So we talked to our good friends at ARM about what they had in store, and they were telling us about a couple of pieces of IP that they were about to launch into the market at the time, the Cortex-M55 real-time MCU core, the Ethos U55 micro MPU acceleration unit, and also the Cortex-A32 application MCU core. So that is what we have based our devices on. In the E1 series of Ensemble devices, the single core MCU, we have a single Cortex-M55 core that runs up to 160 megahertz. And we also have the option to pair that with an Ethos U55 micro MPU acceleration unit that is 128 max per cycle wide. This E1 series is the kind of low power foundation of the Ensemble family. We have essentially pulled out all the tricks in the book in order to make this use as little power as possible. And then we build the other execution environments for the E3, the E5, and the E7 on top of that. So you can always kind of revert execution to this high efficiency sensor hub-like core. So if you take an E3 and we kind of look at how that plays there, you have the M55, the 160 megahertz M55, and you have optionally the ethos unit that is also available in the E1 configuration. But then we add to that a high-performance compute environment in the form of an M55 that runs a little bit over twice as fast using high-performance silicon, high-performance memories, so that it can essentially compute data quicker. And we also pair that up optionally with an Ethos U55 unit that is twice as wide as the one that we put in the E1 series. So now you have two accelerators, you have two cores. But you can run the system for the most part on the high efficiency side of the device, doing all your environment sensing, figuring out if something is going on around the device that needs a bit more looking into, so to speak. And when that happens, the high efficiency environment can wake up the high performance side of the chip. It can come online. It can very quickly figure out what is going on. It can run a much more detailed machine learning model, for instance, to classify why did the light in the room come on? You know, was it because somebody came in? Was it a person? Was it a pet? Things like that. And then that can be powered down so that it doesn't use any power at all uh, once it's done. And then in the E5 device, we add the Cortex-A32 core to run high-level operating systems that can provide a rich user interface, that can provide access to advanced networking protocols, and all the things that is very easy to do with MPU type systems in terms of having a rich set of software libraries available for those type of tasks. 
And in the E7, we kick it up another notch and we add two Cortex-A32 cores in a symmetric configuration so that you can run more threads across both cores and provide more high-level services on top of the real-time systems. Henrik, can you give us an overview of what else is offered with these devices? Yes, I can absolutely do that. The slide that you're looking at right now is kind of a 15,000 foot view of the superset of the Ensemble family. This is with everything that we can offer inside the device grouped into these boxes. The top row is what you saw on the previous slide. That's the application environments. That's where the user's code will run on the A32 cores, on the M55 cores, or if it's neural network on the Ethos U55 micro MPU acceleration units. These execution environments, they plug into a transactional bus. And one of the key things in the Ensemble family is that we use a common bus fabric across all the series of our devices. This is one of the things that gives us that software compatibility, the ability for you to run code on a device from one of the subfamilies. And if you want to move that to another series of devices, as long as the resources exist, you can access them in the same way and everything will work just as it did in the part of the system that you were coming from, so to speak. So that transactional bus fabric that connects the application cores to the shared resources in the system is really key for that compatibility. I mentioned before that because we're on an advanced kind of processing technology generation, we can include a lot of advanced functions and a lot of memory in our devices while still maintaining a very small physical footprint. And you see examples of that here. In terms of SRAM, the ensemble devices can go as high as 13 and a half megabytes of integrated on-die memory, RAM memory. And then in terms of non-volatile memory, this is traditionally flash in terms of microcontrollers, but we use MRAM technology because it provides a lot of benefits over flash. We can fit almost six megabytes of MRAM on die in the ensemble devices. And this is shared between all the cores, even the A32s, the M55, and also the Ethos units can all access this memory. We have a lot of digital interfaces, of course, since these are microcontroller products. And you will find all of the standard digital interfaces that uh, tend to be considered together with MCUs, such as serial ports and sensor interfaces, communication interfaces like USB and Ethernet, CAN, et cetera. All of that is available in the Ensemble family as well. We have ways also in the digital side to expand the available memory. If you, for instance, want to run more Linux in your system, you can add external RAM, you can add external NVM for that through Octal Spy expansion interfaces. So you have everything on the digital side that you would need for your design. We have a dedicated subsystem for graphics and imaging where we put a GPU unit that can help accelerate drawing operations on big displays. And we also have camera interfaces and display interfaces in the subsystem. And we include both MIPI serial as well as parallel versions of both. So regardless of whether you have a parallel camera or a serial camera or a parallel display or a MIPI serial display, they can all be connected to an ensemble device and we'll be able to drive them. As I mentioned before, when we talked a little bit about security and how we consider that to be fundamentally important for devices being designed at the moment, we have included a complete secure enclave in our system. I say complete, when I say that, I mean that this is an actual secure microcontroller inside the microcontroller. It has its own MCU core. It has its own secured memory to hold things like keys and certificates. And we provision a secure device identity into every device that we make, meaning that you can immediately use this enclave as a strong root of trust for your system. And it handles a secure boot system for all the application cores. It handles uh, lifecycle management. And we also have the ability to configure firewalls across the bus fabric in the device to let you partition you know, exactly how much RAM, exactly which interfaces you want to let code running on a specific core access. So you can have a tiered security model in your system. Then in addition to that, we include a rich set of analog functionality. We have 24-bit Sigma Delta ADCs. We have fast SAR ADCs. We have comparators. We have programmable gain amplifiers. We have DACs. So we have everything that you need in order to drive analog sensors in addition to all the digital capabilities we have. And then to round everything off, we have a power management subsystem that is sort of partly autonomous, actually, that divides all of this functionality into eight domains, each domain powered by its own LDO. And that LDO is sized according to the needs of the specific domain, so you don't lose a bunch of power 
by providing oversized LDOs for things that don't need that much power. And we also do all the DC to DC converting internal to the device. So uh, you don't need a PMIC for an LF device. It's all handled internally. And that helps save cost and reduces the bill of material for the overall system. On the right side of this slide, there is a picture of the Superset E7 device in chip scale format. And you see it's only six and a half by seven millimeters. So we can be very small. And of course, we have other package types as well to suit the need for the specific product being developed. So how can my audience know which series is a best fit for their application? It depends a little bit on specifically what features and functions your application needs. On this slide here, and there's some animations baked into this slide to step you through exactly how this rolls out all of the functions from the kind of superset image that you saw into the various series of the device. You can see that in the single core, E1 devices, we have the MCU core, we have the MPU acceleration unit. We go up to four and a quarter megabyte of SRAM on the E1 devices, which is very memory rich for this class of device and almost up to two megabytes of NVM. So one and a half megabytes of MRAM is available in the E1 series. And then all the serial and sensor interfaces that you need for use cases like cargo and asset tracking, failure prediction, power conversion, embedded control, et cetera. And we also have a dedicated low power camera interface for the MPU in the E1 configuration. In the E3 series, where we add the second MCU core and the second MPU, this is where we go up to the full 13 and a half megabytes of SRAM in the uh, ensemble family of devices. And we also go up to five and three quarter megabytes of non-volatile MRAM memory here. We add more high-speed interfaces like uh, Ethernet, like CAN, we add HMI interfaces to drive graphics on, on screens. We add the GPU unit to be able to accelerate that drawing. So the E3 device is essentially a perfect fit for something like a wearable, an HMI panel, all kinds of smart camera applications, as well as biometric ID solutions, things that need to be able to maybe detect faces to identify persons based on the sound of their voice, things like that. When we go up to the E5 devices, this is where we start adding the Cortex-A32 MPU cores into the system, making them ideal for things like process control uh, applications that also needs to have graphical interfaces to render the various process states, things like vending machines that needs to be able to uh, control multiple systems. Same with appliances, things that need to be able to control motors to be able to have a very high accuracy precision side on the real-time system and also handle a user interface and things like EV recharge stations, et cetera. And when we go up to the E7 device, where we add both MPU cores, this is where kind of the high compute intensive applications like portable medical devices, like robotics, drones, and handheld point of sale system, for instance, will be an ideal pairing for the E7's capabilities. Okay, so you also mentioned high integration earlier as well. Can we take a closer look at that too? We can absolutely do that. And I want to talk a little bit about not just what it is that we integrate, but also why we integrate these things. Because this is an important thing that we have learned working with this technology for many, many years. At the end of the day, what we want to be able to get to with the microcontroller design is a design that has all the functions that the application needs and that integrates that in a way that is very power efficient. And you see on this slide a couple of things. Essentially, when you build a system and you don't have high integration, when you have various functions that are not connected to the same bus infrastructure, this is what we mean by off-die in this slide, it tends to drive up energy consumption. When you need to have your memory external, your security solution external, if you need to have an assortment of peripherals on separate physical chips in the design, when you need to have a lot of power conditioning things in the design, it drives up power consumption because you won't have a central point that is able to orchestrate the access of all these functions. If you can integrate everything on the same bus, there is no part of the system that needs to always be awake to listen if something wants to communicate with it. So when you have that central point, you have a very fine-grained control of exactly what needs to be turned on and you only have to turn it on when it is needed by the code that is running. 
this is one of the kind of overarching design goals of Ensemble to try to put as much as we possibly can on the die itself. And it sounds like, you know, well, that's obvious. It's a, an easy thing to do, but it really isn't because when you kind of look at the functions that you put in microcontrollers today, there are some of them that takes very precise technology in order to be able to integrate onto the same die. So you have to work really hard in order to kind of find a system where you can put the right speed for analog, the right accuracy for digital, and also the right size to be able to have the correct memories and things like that in the system. So Henrik, you talked earlier about how you're architected for the lowest possible power consumption. So can you explain that in a bit more depth? Yes, I can do that. We have developed a power control system that we call AIPM, Autonomous Intelligent Power Management. The purpose of AIPM is to only power what is needed when that thing is needed in the system. I mentioned before that we have partitioned all of the shareable resources, as we call them, in our system, as well as the cores into eight separate power domains. These power domains can be independently switched on and off as needed, and the on and off state can be determined in an ensemble device automatically by hardware that we have designed to be able to monitor the activity within each processing domains. We have divided our devices into three major functional regions, the high performance region, the high efficiency region, and then there is an always on region, which is essentially the functions that always need to be powered so that you can wake the device up. This is what it looks like if we consider an E7 MCU. You have the Aon region, the always on region. This is things like the real-time clock. There are certain peripherals that are always powered to be able to wake the system from sleep. This is the part of the system that when you have a battery attached to it, this will never be put to sleep. This is what is being powered when you're in the lowest possible power mode of the device. Then as you move from the Aon region up to the high efficiency region, this is where the application cores come in. So in the high efficiency region, we have this Cortex-M55 high efficiency core. This is the one running at 160 megahertz. And the ethos unit that is paired with that, as well as a set of low power utilities specifically designed to work with the high efficiency core while using less power. So essentially, we have a set of peripherals that have been configured in a way to use less power and then we have a set of more powerful peripherals that gets woken up once we transition into kind of the high performance type of operation. This is where all the bulk memory that is bus attached will come online. This is where all the peripherals will be available. This is where a lot of debug functions like trace becomes turned on. And also this is where the high performance M55 core and the A32 cores will get powered up when they are needed to perform heavy processing tasks. So essentially we have this kind of ladder where we can step up and down. We can drop everything down to sleep and then we can have a small peripheral wake us up whenever it detects something. The high efficiency region can be turned on always or for most of the time to do processing of the data that is collected from the low power interfaces. And then you can wake the high performance region up when something needs to be classified into more detail or when more processing power is required. So Henrik, what kind of improvements can designers expect from the Cortex-M55, especially for artificial intelligence and machine learning? So this is something that I think is really neat. I've been in this industry for a long time, and it tends to be when you kind of move from one generation of processing core to another, that you see some incremental changes and you see some little things be added because something has been an annoyance or not quite as efficient as it could have been in the previous generation. But what has happened with the introduction of the M55 and the Ethos U55, and especially in the way that we've been able to design them into our system, it's really orders of magnitude more uplift in performance than you have seen before for these type of applications. On this slide here, there is a couple of screenshots from presentations that we did together with ARM at their Dev Summit conference back in October of 2021. This is when we spun out the first generation of our silicon to the market. And ARM, of course, they don't make microcontrollers or microprocessors, they make IP. So they were very interested in getting hold of some real chips to compare them with the simulated results that they were expecting in terms of performance uplift. 
for the combination of M55 and U55, specifically on neural networks. They had expected a 500x uplift in performance compared to their reference Cortex-M4 type devices. But with our system that we had designed, and especially because of the way that we have implemented our memory hierarchies and some other things, we were able to almost get to an 800x improvement. I think we tapped out at about 796x, but it's close enough, so I'll take it. And that's, of course, really great because when you can do the AI faster, when you can run inferences quicker, one thing you can do is you can put more artificial intelligence into the model and you can have systems that can do more complex tasks. And this is why we say that Ensemble is a revolution for microcontrollers because it's able to not just do the vibration and the voice use cases, but it can also do the vision use cases. You can actually run machine learning with an Ensemble device on live image data captured from the camera interfaces. The other side of that is when you can do the inferencing quick, that means that you have more time for the application to sleep if it's battery powered. And that was another thing that we looked into together with ARM, kind of power efficiency. How does having access to this fast machine learning engines improve the battery efficiency of the system? And you see that on the other screenshots in the slide, the increase in efficiency specifically on the example that we looked into here was 75X, which is really quite dramatic because if you consider an application that is running for one week on a battery and you apply this kind of uplift to that, now you're running for more than a year on that same battery. One example here, there is a machine learning model called MobileNet, which is used for object classification. It's an open source model, it's widely used. And when you look at performance and power data on an ensemble system using MobileNet v2, and you compare the inference speed and the energy consumption of executing that model on a microcontroller core alone versus accelerated with the help of the U55, an inference, a meaning to classify one image, takes 624 milliseconds when it's run on our Cortex-M55 core at 400 megahertz. But when I offload that model onto the Ethos U, I can drop down the inference speed from 624 milliseconds down to only eight. I use a little bit more power because I have the Ethos and the M55 turned on at the same time. But because the inference speed is so short, I drop the energy use of the system for that inference period from 228 to three millijoules, meaning that you get a lot more time back to the MCU to do other things, additional features, or to just sleep and conserve battery. Henrik, can you give us a quick demo of the Aleph MCU at work? Sure, I can do that. We recorded a couple of videos recently where we are running AI demos on our latest development boards, what we call the app kits. And I can play you one of them right now. This is going to be a demonstration of a facial tracking solution running entirely out of resources in the Ensemble device on the board. It is running a version of the YOLO FAST model, uh, which is trained on faces. So it can detect and it can track faces. As I move the camera around here, you should be seeing that this model is tracking and following my face and drawing a bounding box around it. Um, with the machine learning acceleration units that we have, uh, we're using the Ethos U55 micro MPU from ARM uh, inside our ensemble devices. We're able to perform a YOLO fast inference in about seven milliseconds, meaning that uh, in the complete system right now, running on the high performance Cortex M55 core uh, in the ensemble device, I am processing frames at about 142 frames per second using this model, which is a significant improvement to traditional microcontrollers. Uh, if you try to use um, a model of this complexity on something like a Cortex M4, you'll only see a couple of frames per second worth of performance. Uh, and this runs uh, well over 100 frames per second, even with uh, application overhead, such as drawing on the display, drawing the bounding box, and all the other things included. So what sort of external components are required? So this is the thing that we really wanted to get to when we talked about how we architected Ensemble for the highest possible level of integration. We wanted to try to make it so that you don't really need any external components to do these type of applications. We wanted to try to include everything in a single chip to essentially create a machine learning pipeline with enough resources to handle the task and not require any major external components. There is an example, a little video clip on this slide here of a facial tracker that a company that we work with designed 
where you can enroll a face and the system will be able to detect if that face is in front of the camera and it will be able to also map additional faces as they come into frame. So this is one example. If you think about this, this could be a security system where you know if the owner is in front of the camera, the thing unlocks. If there's more people than the owner, it might want to warn the owner that, you know, hey, somebody's behind you, somebody's looking. And in order to realize this, you need to be able to enroll the face. You need to be able to detect where is that face looking, which is done in this model here. So it's a pretty complicated system. It's definitely not something that you can implement just by writing C code on a traditional microcontroller. So usually you would require multiple components. You require you know, a large PCB. You would require multiple resources in terms of designing this and putting it together. But with Aleph Solution, a single E3MCU can handle all of these tasks and do it with just the internal resources in the device. We take in images from the camera via a MIPI CSI interface. The little video snippet on this slide was recorded on a screen that was connected to the development board that you see on the slide here. We perform ISP functions in software to adjust white balance, to reduce image noise, to debayer the data that the CMOS sensor is producing. All of that is done using the high performance M55's vector extensions. So it's really fast in performing those kind of tasks. And all the input buffers are located in on die SRAM. And then for the machine learning, we store the model in compressed format in our MRAM and we decompress that on the fly as it is being executed into an arena in SRAM, also internal. And then we run all the inferencing from that arena internal to the device on the M55 and the Ethos U55 core. And then for the image output, the graphic buffers for the display is also in on die memory. All of the work to render the image and to draw the bounding boxes to highlight the facial landmarks and the jaw angles and all of that. It's also done internally. And we drive everything out, one of our display interfaces, in this case, the MIPI DSI interface in 24-bit color. So no external memories, no external power management. And also, and this is important for machine learning applications in particular, since we can host everything internal to the device, you don't need any dedicated security solutions outside the chip to protect that IP because these type of AI models have become more and more a target for extraction by people that want to essentially repurpose them for their own use since it's a high cost to develop them and to train them, et cetera. So we have the facilities to host everything in the device complicating that extraction process and also our secure enclave if anything needs to be stored outside of the device can make sure that that can be stored encrypted and as it's being pulled into the device, it gets decrypted on the fly so that we add an extra layer of security around everything. Speaking of security, you mentioned a strong security element as well. Can we talk about that a bit? Yes, we can. What you see on this slide is a high-level overview of the type of security that we put in our device in order to help protect not just the application, but also all of the data that the application is handling. And we decided to kind of take this also a couple of steps further than what is traditionally done in mass market MCU type systems. It tends to be that there is a couple of choices you can make. You can buy the secure solution, which has a reduced function set, but more security. Or you can buy the standard solution, which has the full set of functionality, but almost none of the security. And for you to be able to construct your system, you need to kind of pick both. But we've decided to integrate everything in all of the ensemble devices. So we do provide this isolated security subsystem that can protect the application, the data, all the critical functions of the system from threats. This includes a unique device ID being set up in secure memory for each individual chip that we produce, and the dedicated security processor that is the only entity in the device that can access that protected memory. So the device essentially comes with a fully established route of trust out of the gate. And you have also the ability to add your own secrets into that protected memory before you advance the lifecycle and deploy it, as we do also include the complete lifecycle management state machine in the solution. And then we have these configurable firewalls that allows you to essentially partition all of the resources in the system in such a way that you know exactly which code running on which cores that can access which particular part of the system. If you're familiar with the Trust Zone technology that ARM has been marketing for a secure embedded solution, 
you can think of our solution as an extension of that. In Trust Zone, you kind of have two worldviews. There is a secure part of the system and there is an unsecured part of the system. With Alice Ensemble, you can create multiple security tiers, each tier customized for the specific CPU core. So you have a much more granular way of protecting your device. So Henrik, what does the architecture look like for this secure system? This diagram on this slide shows you how the security solution is on a high level rolled into the system. So you see you have in the top left corner of this slide, you got your CPU and MPU. This is your microprocessor and microcontroller cores, as well as the machine learning accelerators. And then also all the DMA masters on the other side. These are essentially the bus masters in the system. And then the secure enclave and the function that we call the configuration matrix sits in between them. And the configuration matrix is what configures or allows or disallows access between the masters and the slaves in the diagram. So the slaves would be the memories, the peripherals, both the analog as well as the digital, anything that is in the memory space of the device. This configuration matrix is entirely set up by the user of the ensemble device. They get to control all aspects of it. And during the secure boot process in the ensemble system, when the secure enclave wakes up, it will read the configuration matrix. It will apply the configuration to the firewalls on the bus, and then it will wake up the core that is designated to be the first one to boot. The secure enclave also extends outside of the device in the sense that it controls access to debug ports and also has this decrypt on the fly capability to be able to protect contents of external memories, things like OSPI connected memories and other things that live outside of the chip. And you see some examples in the list beneath this chip render here of services that are provided by the software interface to the secure enclave. This is 100% turnkey ready for application use in an ensemble system. You don't need to do any particular development. The secure enclave is ready to service all of these functions out of the gate from applications running on any of the cores. Okay, so Henrik, if my audience is ready to get started designing, do you guys have any application or development kits available? We certainly do. We partner with Aero Electronics as a global distribution partner, and they have our development kits in stock. The one on the left-hand side is what we call our development kit or our dev kit. On this board, you'll see the E7 device on the SODIM kind of module car that snaps into that baseboard that brings out all the signals to pins, that brings out all the functions to uh, interfaces and connectors for things like USB and Ethernet. There's connectors to attach cameras and displays and batteries and SD cards and the like on this uh, board as well. So everything is ready for you to start attaching your peripheral devices that you want to drive from the Aleph Ensemble and to get started. We also have a new board that is on its way now to Aero stock that we call the application kit or the app kit. This kit comes with more functionality included out of the box for you to be able to start exploring more from the software perspective and not so much uh, when it comes to kind of setting up a hardware system. It includes a display, a color display that is 4.3 inches uh, across. It includes a camera, a MIPI CSI two-lane camera, so that you can capture uh, images for running inferences or other tasks. It includes a Wi-Fi BLE module from Telet so that you can experiment wireless connectivity, and also an IMU sensor from Bosch, as well as microphones so that you can collect uh, audio data and use that in your inference operations or whatnot. All of this is going to be available, well, the dev kit is available now from Aero Electronics, and the app kit is soon to be available from Aero. If you want to get your hands on it, you can contact us through our website and we'll be able to facilitate that for you. Excellent. So Henrik, if my audience wants more information, where should they go? They should absolutely come and visit our brand new website at alifsami.com. We're looking very much forward to hearing from the viewers of this Chalk Talk here and to talk to them and understand more about what they are looking to do with their applications and to see how we can help. We believe that Ensemble is going to allow the users of it to unlock a whole new level of creativity in embedded systems design compared to what they are usually getting from traditional suppliers. 
That is fantastic. Well, Henrik, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Aleph Semiconductor. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.